So first of all, for any of you guys that are veterans, I know some of you are, happy Veterans Day. It's a day that we, uh, Armistice Day, where we called peace after World War I. And it's also a day of remembrance for a lot of folks. Um, and then thank you for your service. So you know, as veterans, it's nice because we get two, two days where people can thank us for our service. I spent 30 years in the Navy. Um, so I'm a veteran, retired Navy Master Chief. Um, so I definitely have an interest in military history and uh, especially aircraft and stuff like that. So this one here is kind of a tribute to uh, just, you know, being on Veterans Day since our clinic's on Veterans Day is uh, going over some of the history of the U.S. Army Spruce Railroad Production Division in World War II. I mean, World War I, I'm sorry, World War I. And stuff we'll go over in this clinic is uh, some World War I history and developing aircraft technology and tactics, uh, the Spruce Division formation, U.S. production efforts to support the uh, building of aircraft, um, the Puget Sound District, which is the northern portion of uh, the Olympic Peninsula, which is specifically what I'm going to talk about. And then construction of development of the North Olympic Peninsula area uh, for railroading and logging, lumbering operations to haul spruce out. And then after the war, there was a lot of stuff that uh, continued to develop on the Olympic Peninsula. That's very interesting. And then uh, some go over some logging, logistics and equipment developments after the war, after the spruce division pulled out. And then we'll look at some of the remaining areas artifacts and legacy of that area. Um, well, and we'll touch back on what Alan was talking about, the uh, Olympic Discovery Trail out there on the peninsula. So <clears throat> why would I be interested in uh, the Spruce Railroad Division? First of all, disclaimer, I'm not a historian by any means. It's just some stuff that I kind of stumbled on um, look, you know, researching other things. I had no idea that there was a spruce production division in Washington to haul spruce out of the woods in World War I until probably, you know, 20 years ago or so. Um, like I said, I spent 30 years in the Navy, naval aviation. Um, so w when I was a kid in the 70s, you know, I liked to build model airplanes. I got interested in tanks and armor and stuff and, you know, racing cars and muscle cars, all, you know, all the model building things that we used to do. Some of us may have used to do it when we were kids. Um, so all that stuff was very interesting, all the technology and whatnot. My dad was a model railroader and he had a few books around. <clears throat> and one in particular was Railroads in the Woods by uh, John Lobb and uh, Vernon Go. Excellent book. And once I found that book in his library, I went through it cover to cover probably once a week, you know, over and over and over again, and just really got my brain uh, in tune with logging railroads, you know, geared locomotives, shays, climaxes, heislers, um, high lead logging, all that kind of stuff was fascinating. Um, I grew up in Southern California near the beach. So we didn't have humongous trees and stuff like that. So it, reading, reading about it was, was very interesting. Well, eventually my naval career took me up here to Washington and I got to see those trees and you know, develop a true appreciation for the, uh, the type of effort that it took to haul those logs out of the woods and stuff. So I'm, as a model railroader, my first primary interest was, was logging, some type of logging railroad. <clears throat> um, so with airplanes and stuff, one of the things that uh, they discovered in World War I was that airplanes were very useful. Um, you know, before World War, World War I started in what, 1914? Um, before World War I, <clears throat> you know, the aircraft was just barely being developed. You know, 1909 was the first flight of the Wright brothers. 
uh, the first, you know, real flight. Um, and then from there on, you know, aircraft technology just took off. Well, what they found in World War I was that uh, aircraft could be used very effectively for reconnaissance and seeing where the enemy's at. Um, you know, World War I was kind of a confluence of old school technology and uh, the introduction of new technology and discovering ways to use things. Um, the old technology is you, you take, you know, a regiment of guys on one side, another regiment of guys on the other side, and you aim at each other and start shooting. You know, the old, you know, Civil War style, Napoleon style war fighting. Well, that developed into trench warfare, where, you know, you would form the lines on either side, the enemy and the opposition or whatever, and they started to develop these trenches where they would hide out in trenches and form their lines between between enemies and basically use artillery to just shell each other over and over and over. And these lines would move a little bit one way or the other, but not significantly. And you can see, and this is a great picture because you can see down there on the ground where there's a trench that's been dug out where there's probably a bunch of dudes in there. And then you can see on the left side, maybe there's big craters where there's been artillery shells slamming the ground where there used to be a trench maybe. Um, so that what they discovered with aircraft and balloons and blimps and stuff also is that they could take a lot of aerial photography and um, basically plot out strategy, flanking maneuvers, um, end arounds, see where the enemies- Hey Rich. Taking their stuff. We're yeah, only ahead. seeing your map. Say again. We're only seeing the map of the peninsula. Oh, you are. Hold on a second. Us too. How about that? There you go. Good. That was good. Yep. How about this? Different picture? That's good. It's good. Okay. Sorry. So, like I said, <clears throat> here's the trench. You can see that. You can see the craters over here. So, we're talking about art artillery and man movements all being um, viewed by aircraft or blimps and balloons in the air. So, one of the first things they started using aircraft for besides recon is shooting observation balloons down. Um, you have a guy in the cockpit or something with a rifle shooting at the other guy in a balloon <clears throat> or shooting the balloon down. Well, eventually that led to um, aircraft shooting each other. So the picture on the right here shows a kind of a dramatic example of dogfighting. The picture on the left here shows a, an aviator holding a, a camera that would be used to take pictures of the battlefield. Um, so airplanes became increasingly important as the war, war drug on. The problem was, was that the allies uh, didn't have direct access to construction materials, namely wood, to build these aircraft. The Germans had access to the um, uh, Norwegian area with the lumber that they needed. So they didn't have any problems building airplanes and their airplanes were technically superior to most of the allied aircraft. So there was probably a, you know, a two or three to one ratio of uh, allied aircraft getting shot down to every German aircraft. So the, the allies were in dire need of creating a lot more airplanes than the Germans needed to, because they were getting shot down a lot more. So the, so during World War I, these production demands increased. And here's a couple examples of uh, factories putting airplanes together. And the lumber that they're using is, of course, Sitka spruce. The spruce is super light. It's uh, very resilient to uh, like bullet strafing. It won't shatter. It's got very tight grain. 
it's kind of equivalent to what aluminum is today or composite materials are today to aircraft. So in World War I, the aircraft losses in general, the German lost about 27,000 airplanes and the Allied, uh, Allies lost about 88,000 aircraft. So that just tells you, you know, it doesn't tell you how many airplanes were produced. It just tells you how many they lost. So those losses dictated, you know, the increase in production that was required to keep up with uh, getting shot down all the time. So they required a great deal of spruce. Um, the Pacific Northwest was a primary exporter of the spruce lumber. Um, but the problem was the uh, Pacific Northwest initially around 1916 or so, um, they were producing it, but it were not producing lumber at the rate that was required in order for the allies to keep up with aircraft production. And then this is just a quick interlude on what is spruce. These are uh, some examples of trees, old growth trees that are located out at Deception Pass. Um, so these are like untouched trees you can still see today. They're actually out on um, on Hoipus Point, if anybody's familiar with that, the um, where the park entrance is to Deception Pass at the, the stoplight. If you go left, it goes down to um, down to a little marina down there. There's a there's a trailhead there, and you can walk out. And these these humongous trees are out there in the in the woods out there. Anyway, the center one is a spruce tree, and you can tell by the distinctive uh, tight bark that it has. It's kind of a scaly scaly bark. And I just threw in these other examples: a big cedar over there on the left with the straight. Um, straight bark with the long lines on it, and then Douglas fir with the really rough um, bark, very distinctive rough bark on a Douglas fir. Douglas fir was also in high demand um, from the Northwest or the West Coast in general for building ships. Ships were still made of wood during that time, so Douglas fir was also in demand. But for the aircraft production, spruce was the required material that they needed. So in order to meet demand, the War Department stepped in. Um, <clears throat> just a little, little bit of a timeline here. So 1914, World War I starts, and the Panama Canal opened up at the same time, coincidentally, uh, which created a critical supply route to Europe. Um, U.S. enters World War I in 1917 after uh, several German U-boat attacks on supply ships. <clears throat> and then on the aircraft and the battlefront, aircraft tactics kind of created a stalemate on the battlefront in that the, you know, the enemy troops on either side couldn't really do a whole lot on the battlefield because they were being watched the entire time. So it's similar to today where we have satellites spying on everything on the world so we know what's going on. Same thing was starting to happen there on the battlefront where you couldn't move our artillery around or you had to really conceal it very well or do things at night um, because you know, there's constantly airplanes flying around checking out what you were doing. <clears throat> so the allies plan to overcome the technology differential that they had with the Germans is just to increase production on aircraft and just kept keep throwing as much as they could out there. Um, but what they found was that the U.S. West Coast was kind of disorganized. There was a lot of labor disputes and things going on, and they just couldn't meet demand for the lumber requirements. So the U.S. Army stepped in, and they assigned <clears throat> Colonel Bryce Disk to lead and organize the Spruce Production Division on the West Coast to increase production. So his, his charge was to come out to the West Coast, really, and see what was going on, what he could do to organize uh, these different logging companies um, and, and in effect, basically unionize them and bring them together. So one of their strategies, which was very successful, was to establish the Loyal Legion of Loggers and Lumbermen. <clears throat> if you've ever studied any Northwest lumbering logging history, 
you probably ran across this uh, LLL, um, either either the their patches or just description of of who they were, and it was basically just taking all these disassociated um, loggers and lumbermen, these like uh, sort of unions, I guess, labor unions, and organizing them all together to um, produce solely for the war effort. The uh, the LLL, the 4L guys, they had to take an oath, um, and they're basically uh, recruited into the army as part of the uh, the war effort. They were also they were guaranteed, you know, good housing, good food, um, set hours, a lot of things that they weren't getting in their regular um, logging companies. The uh, Spruce Production Division set up headquarters in Oregon, in Portland, Oregon. And then they set up an operations, their major operations center in Vancouver, Washington, which is Fort Vancouver. And that's a, uh, that's a preserved historic site that you can still go visit today. And there was nearly 30,000 men assigned to the Spruce Production Division. And in 15 months, the division produced over 145 million board feet of lumber, whereas before that, they were only getting about 2 million board feet of lumber a month, maybe. So they, they increased production by like 10 times during the time period that it, it existed. So this is just a general map of the world during 1918, I think is where I got it from. Um, that shows, you know, generally where we are. Here's our supply and here's the demand over here. Um, when you think about it, in those days, you know, there's only a couple ways to move things by rail or by ship. So the ships would have to come out somewhere, you know, either Seattle or Port Angeles or somewhere, uh, deep water ports, and come all the way around through the Panama Canal and then head over across the Atlantic. They're very vulnerable in this area because of German U-boats. Um, so there were some production efforts started in the United States, the Curtis Aircraft Company in particular. So a lot of lumber could move by rail to the East Coast and then could be shipped out or complete aircraft could be shipped out. So there were some logistical challenges, but um, you know, to visualize it, you can imagine how hard it was for them to to get this stuff over there, but they did it and they did it quite quickly. So considering the time and here the bound this uh, graph down here, it just shows the production numbers starting in 1917 up through 19, the end of 1918. All right, so once the uh, spruce production division got going and I'm not, like I said, I'm not a historian, I'm not gonna get into all the nuts and bolts and rivet counting of the, how, what the army did, um, it's just in general. So they had, they established these districts throughout the West Coast, uh, Washington and Oregon. Um, a lot of the archives really focus on the uh, Oregon uh, efforts because that was the most accessible to photographers and, and press releases and stuff like that. Um, so you see when you go search through um, like the University of Oregon archives or University of Washington archives, you'll find a lot of photos from um, is Oregon operations. Once you get up into Washington, you got the Grays Harbor area, which was already kind of pre-established. Um, a lot of railroads were up here already that were already operating, um, hauling logs out to Grays Harbor and into uh, Willapa Bay at Raymond, South Bend area. So that, that was already kind of happening. So they just had to jump on top of it and like, okay, now you guys are working for the army. Roger that, let's go. So, so that was a fairly easy effort to get going. But the one that uh, interests me in particular is up in the Puget Sound District up here at the top. And this is the whole Olympic Peninsula basically. Um, and there was, you can see there was 4,800 soldiers assigned to this area. Um, but it was at the time it was the most remote location of old growth spruce, but it was some of the most desirable spruce that they that they had found. So 
a major effort went on up here to haul that spruce out in areas that were not established at all. So um, there was a lot of construction that needed to be done in order to get that spruce out of there. And then here's this picture shows the same map, but it shows the uh, different spruce railroads that were designated by the, uh, by the Army. So there were 13 railroads in all that either followed existing lines or lines were built in order to accommodate uh, those railroads. The ones that are up in the uh, Olympic Peninsula is uh, Spruce Railroad number one and two, which uh, provided that spruce to mainly to Port Angeles and Clallam Bay. And it was all part of uh, Clallam and Jefferson County. And there's a couple of pictures of some army dudes sitting on an old stump. Here's a builder's photo of a brand new Heisler that was delivered to the army. All right, so like I said, their operational headquarters was in Vancouver, Washington. Uh, this is just an overview map of the uh, mill area that was there at Vancouver. Um, and it was a major, uh, major mill area where, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the lumber produced was was uh, finished here and then shipped all over the all over the place. Um, and at Vancouver, you can still go to the uh, historical site. It's on the uh, it's a national park. There's an army airfield there. There's uh, all kinds of old structures that you can see. And then they have a museum that actually has a scale HO scale um, model of the uh, original mill site area that was out there at uh, Fort Vancouver. Has anybody been there? No? So if you ever go to Vancouver, something to go check out. They got airplanes in there and trains and all kinds of stuff. All right, so since I'm kind of local to um, the Olympic Peninsula and I go ride my bicycle out there all the time, um, I wanted to focus on the Puget Sound Division because I'm kind of familiar with the area. And I'm sure some of you are too, living fairly close by the Port Townsend Ferry, just a you know half hour ride over there and you can explore all over the place. So anyway, there was, like I said, there was massive stands of untapped spruce out there. Um, it's a somewhat isolated area that would require great expense to push a railroad deeper into the woods. So a lot of the local companies that are already um, working out there, they just, they didn't have the resources to connect everything together to do a major, uh, a major output of this lumber. So they, there was connections already out there. There's deep water port at Port Angeles that was already established. And then there was a rail ferry operation at uh, Port Townsend. The uh, Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul, and Pacific, which is the Milwaukee Road, and Port Townsend Southern, Port Angeles, and Western, and various logging railroads were assigned to the uh, spruce production effort. Um, Seams Carry Logging Railroad was um, established between Port Angeles and Lake Pleasant, which is now the town of uh, Beaver off of Highway, Highway 101 going toward, it's about eight miles north of Forks or so, eight or 10 miles north of Forks. And then the Merrill and Ring Railroad was out there, logging railroad between uh, Pisht and Clallam Bay. And then the Puget Sound Mill and Timber had some railroad operations out there, but their main thing that the Army was interested in was the big cut-up mill that they had, they had already established at Port Angeles. So here's that old map <clears throat> that I had earlier. It shows, you know, here's Whidbey Island. So on this map, I live in the town of Santa Fuca right here, which no longer exists. It's just a church. <clears throat> but anyway, this is a 19, this is actually a 1928 map. So this, this line right here is the Milwaukee Road, the orange one going from Port Townsend around Discovery Bay 
This is the town of Blind, where the casino is at today, off of 101. And then on to Port Angeles. And then it starts to make its way out here. But in 1917, when all this started out here, um, the railroad only made it out to about Joyce. And that's on Highway 112 today. So there's a out just just west of Port Angeles, Highway 101 splits off. So you go left to go 101 on the south side of uh, Lake Crescent, and then the north side goes along the coast on Highway 112. You can go all the way out to Nia Bay that way. But anyway, so the railroad to Milwaukee ended at Joyce. Now it wasn't necessarily called the Milwaukee at that time. Uh, it was. Port Townsend and Western or Port Angeles or Seattle Port Angeles and Pacific or something. I don't know. There's, there's different names used for this line right here, but they were all subsidies of the Milwaukee road. It's just that Milwaukee was probably avoiding um, certain fees that they may have had to pay or right away, whatever. So trying to save some money. So they basically, had these lines of subsidies to the Milwaukee Road, but they weren't actually called the Milwaukee Road out here. There was also a line that um, took off. Some folks don't know this, but there was a line from Discovery Bay here at uh, Discovery Junction that actually went south down to Quilcene. So there was a railroad that went to Quilcene. You know, and prior to World War I, Port Townsend was supposed to be the, the uh, next uh, San Francisco of the Northwest. So there was a lot of effort put into trying to connect Port Townsend with the rest of Puget Sound. It just, they ran out of money, they ran out of uh, ability to get through the mountains down here, and it just never happened. So, it, you know, a lot of the resources dried up before uh, they could complete the line, and Seattle and Tacoma area were you know, much more profitable at the time. So a lot of effort wasn't spent on this line, trying to make it around the sound all the way over to the uh, Seattle Tacoma area. Anyway, different history tangent. <clears throat> so anyway, the line from Joyce, and then there's this little town right here called Disk, which is named after Colonel Disk. It used to be a different, it used to have a different name, um, but that, you can see this red line that goes along Lake Crescent all the way out here to this little lake, this Lake Pleasant, which is now the town of Beaver. There's an RV park out there. That's the line that needed to be created to get to these virgin stands of Sitka spruce that were out here in this area. And here's a close up view of that line. So here's Joyce right here. And then the, the line eventually made it out to Deep Creek and Twin Rivers. Twin Rivers, I think, is just a sign or a private drive now. There used to be like 30,000 people that lived there uh, back when this was, you know, a lot of lumbering activity going on. This town of uh, Pish used to have a lot of, um, there was booming grounds out here to move logs and stuff on rafts uh, out along the sound or out the, uh, along the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Um, Column Bay was a big dumping ground. And you can see where the Puget Sound Navigation Company has lines here where it connects everything together. So these logging railroads could dump into the ocean here and then barges and tugs and whatnot could push the logs wherever they needed to go to Sawmill, Port Angeles or Port Townsend or wherever. And then the, uh, <clears throat> So the army, once they got out here and kind of cruised all this timber out here, they decided that they needed to build a line from Joyce, basically all the way to Lake Pleasant out here, which is at the time called Taiyi Lake. <clears throat> and this, this uh, line also became what is today called the Spruce Railroad Trail. Um, it's a bicycle trail or a hiking trail that you can go along the north shore of um, Lake Crescent. And we'll see some pictures of that later. All right, so the town of Joyce. Um, 
right now it's a Joyce today. There's a the depot still there, and there's a general store is still there with post office. So if you ever get out that way, you can check it out. Um, there's a logging company called Seams Carry that was contracted to build the right of way from Joyce to the west shore of Lake Crescent, and then eventually to Lake Pleasant, where the main logging sort yards were at. Um, ferry terminals were used on Lake Crescent to move supplies and equipment. So the Olympic Highway, what we know today on the south shore of Lake Crescent, um, was just a dirt road um, and could not really accommodate big trucks and stuff like that. So they relied a lot on the ferry service to get across the lake to you know each side of the construction area to build that grade. The, uh, the route along Lake Crescent required a lot of blasting and there's also the construction of two tunnels on that line. Uh, the entire area between Joyce and Forks was made into a military reservation at the time to prevent sabotage and unauthorized entrance. So, you know, what it is today, I guess it's, that's a pretty large area between Joyce and Forks, probably, I don't know, 30, 40 miles of area. So that was all a military reservation during uh, World War One, And you had to either be in the military or have a draft card that you could show um, in order to get into that area. And they had guard stations set up and stuff at all the roads and access points. The, uh, now, one thing that <clears throat> folks may not know is that the complete connection between Joyce and Lake Pleasant was not completed before the uh, war ended on 11 November 1918. However, construction went on, and in 1919, the line was completed, and that line was used until the 1950s. And we're talking about this red line right here. And this is a picture of the original Joyce station. There's like a log cabin station. There's, uh, there's plans online. It'd be a kind of an interesting project to build something like that. Um, and here's what the, I just, this photo down below is what I got. I got this off of Google Maps. Just zoomed in and then that's what it looks like today on Google. And there's the general store on the left with the little grocery store, laundry and a post office. So that's the town of Joyce. And this was a major operation center for the um, production division this is where all their equipment was delivered, all the construction stuff, all the locomotives, everything showed up here at Joyce. So there was a there was a yard down here, and and um, you know a lot of area for um, office buildings, for administration, and warehouses and stuff like that for storage. Today it just looks like nothing. Here's a couple pictures of uh, Lake Crescent. So this is the North Shore. This is a 1919 picture of the North Shore as they were, they were still building stuff. Um, so they had to make it around. This is uh, Pyramid Mountain. And then that goes all the way down to the, to the west side of the lake. So the, the railroad line followed that North Shore all the way down. And then this is one of the ferries that they used on the right, the haul equipment. I was reading through the book that I have. I think they sunk one of these ferries. They tried to put a locomotive on it, and it was too heavy for the ferry, and they ended up sinking it. They, they saved the locomotive, but the ferry sunk. And this is just some of the right of way they had to deal with. Uh, lots of blasting. This is all rock right here. Um, trying to blast that line out to get it to get the grade through. You notice. You may not or may or may may not notice that this track here is narrow gauge track. And we'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. And here's some timbers being laid down for a crib bridge or the start of a approach to a trestle. So there was lots of trestles I had to build out there as well to get all the way out to uh, Lake Pleasant. So narrow gauge Davenports. So during the construction, the seams carry company 
logging company, they uh, subcontracted to contractors to uh, lay the line out to Lake Crescent. Um, these subcontractors used um, six narrow gauge, 36 inch narrow gauge Davenport 040 tank locomotives to move ballast. They got some, some nice looking little dump cars there, kind of like some Owen 30 stuff that me and Cliff and Alan mess with. Um, so they, they use these exclusively to move all the construction supplies, move rock, um, and whatever they needed to do to build that line through there. So the initial line through the uh, Lake Crescent area was narrow gauge. So for us narrow gauge fans, that's a, that's a, that's a win. Something else to model. And here's just a couple examples of what those little guys look like. Uh, here's a, it's a tank locomotive. I don't know which ones that they had exactly. Uh, there's no pictures on the internet I could find, but uh, they had tank locomotives. It's a tank and there's a saddle tank locomotive, Davenport. Davenport also uh, made geared locomotives um, that had an internal gearing with a two speed drive. They weren't that popular um, in, you know, major logging operations, but I'm, I'm sure they got used a lot for smaller like mining operations and stuff like that construction. There's not a whole lot of data on these things. So it's hard to find stuff about these on the internet. And this is just some general pictures of uh, railroad construction. This is a lot one on the left is kind of cool because they're using a, a gondola with the uh, four and a half bulkheads drop down so they can store rail in there. And then they're using the rail itself to pick up pieces of rail and, and slide them down onto this storage area. Um, kind of cool, bunch of army dudes. It's got, got a lots of, lots of manpower. Instead of using a crane, we just use 14 army guys. And then the one on the right just shows some uh, examples of a some construction in progress with a bunch of materials and get to lay track. So that's definitely standard gauge track right there. So whenever they built that line through Lake Crescent, they had to come back and then relay the actual standard gauge uh, track down once the grading was done with the narrow gauge. And there's here some typical shots of guys working in the woods. Um, a lot of these uh, cabins, like on the left, these were hauled out on rail cars. It was a typical logging operation. But the Army also were very fond of their tents, and they can be set up anywhere, and they're very easy to set up and take down. They're all trained on how to use them, and they had all the equipment for them, so they brought all that stuff out into the woods also. So you see a lot of the, a lot of the scenes with the Army spruce production is a combination of uh, rail, rail carried camp cars and tents and stuff. And then the one on the right here is just a, a donkey. Some guys with a big spruce tree. <clears throat> Their work's cut out for them for the day. It's a pretty big tree or a pretty big log. And then here's some guys, uh, some army guys with a drag saw on the left. Um, so this thing would they would run this guy and it's got like a, an arm here on a rod that moves the saw back and forth and they just let it go and saw through the log. Just its own weight will, will help it cut through the log. And then here's a trestle with some logs being moved over a trestle. There was lots of trestles out there that were either constructed very quickly or temporarily and then removed. Um, so a lot of, a lot of cool stuff. Okay. Sawmills. So all this lumber had to go somewhere. So Port Angeles was, and still is a major um, sawmill area. There's a big pulp mill out there. There's still a big log sorting area out there, at Port Angeles today. Um, and all that was established back early part of this last century. Uh, the left, left map here shows you, the Army's uh, plat, and then there's a log dump 
out here into the ocean. And then it shows, it's kind of hard to see, but there's a sawmill where my mouse is pointed here. That's where the sawmill area was. And then the main line kind of followed this grade right here. And then there's a little trestle over the high tide area right here. Anyway, <clears throat> there's a picture of the sawmill on the right. And then this is a lower picture is a navigational map of that whole area with Edith's Point in Port Angeles. This was a 1948 picture. And a lot of it really hasn't changed on that since it did from when the army was out there from that point. It's a lot different now, but back then it wasn't that much different. And the other major port um, along that line going all the way out past Discovery Bay was Port Townsend. Um, that was already an established uh, rail barge uh, terminal. And then this aerial shot on the right is a more modern picture with the existing marina today. It's still the same, but you can see where the rail barge um, heads out. There was a Y that was built on trestles or piles out into the ocean to get past the tide line. And then, then, then there's a uh, ferry slip out there. And this little picture on the lower right is the uh, Seattle Coast Northern picture switching out that barge there in Port Townsend. That was the last railroad to use that. They shut down in 19, uh, what, 1984 after the Milwaukee Road um, sold it off. So that was in, in use for quite a while, this area here. And it's just just a <clears throat> just general reference, Port Townsend. Here's the 1900s, Port Townsend with the Milwaukee Road train going through the middle of town. And this building you see right here, it's the same building today. This is off of Google Maps on the right. It's the same exact building. It's still sitting there. So a lot of history in that old town. And if you look around at the town and you look around the internet, you'll find a lot of this old stuff still exists today. So it's kind of cool. All right. <clears throat> so the Seams Carry Mill, they, they wanted to build a mill at uh, Lake Pleasant, which is now the town of Beaver. Um, you can see there's where Joyce is on the left, on the right over there, Lake Crescent, Piedmont. So we ran the railroad across from Joyce, across the mountains there, over to the Piedmont area along the North Shore, Lake Crescent, and then eventually connected with uh, Lake Pleasant. The reason they wanted to build a mill down here is because, you know, if something happened, because this Lake Crescent area was uh, susceptible to landslides. So if the line got closed off here, they couldn't get the lumber out to go get it chopped up at the mill. So let's build another mill. And the army was giving them a bunch of money. So they're like, hey, we're going to build another mill down here. So here's the plans on the left um, for the mill site at Lake Pleasant. Um, this, uh, <clears throat> so this line right here where there's a yard and a Y, and you see that curve right there that comes down, that's the main line. And if you look at the picture on the right, this is a shot from Google, uh, from Google Maps. That line is one, Highway 101, which is the exact same line that existed back in 1918. So the highway just follows where the railroad used to be. Uh, this Lake Pleasant area is now a uh, RV park, and there's some residential buildings and stuff out there. There's a there's a gas station here. There is still a um, a log sort yard out here. This uh, Interfor Pacific. So logging trucks today can dump logs and stuff out here, and they can they can sort them out. Um, I, mean, I don't know the, much the history behind that area, but that's probably been there for a long time. Um, and you can look at the back of the map on the left. You can see where the actual mill used to be in this area. And then the line went around the north side of the 
lake and reconnected to go back out in the woods. So it's kind of cool to compare some of these old shots to uh, to Google Maps nowadays. Uh, you know, the old maps to Google Maps today, because you sometimes you can find the contours and the the areas where the railroads used to be just by looking at the existing roads and cuts in the trees and stuff. All right, so one of the things that uh, Seams Carey was able to do was they ordered a whole bunch of shays to support the spruce production division out there on the Olympic coast. Um, and I'm, I'm a real shay fan, so this is a nice little guy right here. This is actually very reminiscent of the first shay that I had, which was an HO scale roundhouse shay kit that I had to build and almost successfully got it to run a few times. I don't know if anybody's ever built one of those roundhouse shays, but they're kind of finicky. Anyway, in July 1918, they ordered 18 shays, and uh, there was 10 70-ton Class Cs, which is a three-truck shay, and then eight was 42-ton Class B, which is a two-truck shay, like the one in this picture right here. Um, three shays were actually delivered, however, to the Olympic Peninsula. And that was uh, these three serial numbers right here, which were all 70 ton shays. The remaining shays went to Vancouver and then they were dispositioned to various buyers after the war. Um, many of them went on to live very productive lives out in the woods. But if it wasn't for the, you know, the Army's effort, they probably wouldn't have bought all those shays at one time. So a lot of cool locomotives got, got purchased and distributed for logging throughout the country. And this is an example of one of the 70-ton uh, shays that was built. Uh, and you can see over here on the right <clears throat> all the different places that it, that it went to. Uh, Seams Carry in 1918, Spruce Production Division. And then it went to Vancouver. It went to Aberdeen. It was in Edmonds, Portland. And it came back to Blind, which is along that same Milwaukee line where the casino's at today, and then to Duckabush, which is down going towards Quilcene, and Carleton, Oregon, I don't know where that's at. Uh, Tillamook, that's out on the coast of Oregon. And yeah, so went to all kinds of places and then it ended up down in uh, Sterling City, California on the Diamond Match Company in 1942. And then it looked like it stayed there for 11 years before it was scrapped. So that locomotive in particular lived a long, happy life out in the woods, all over the place. A, that's a picture of it when it was with the uh, Diamond Match Company. So, you know, change a little bit. Rich, if you notice your notes back there on that one of the last notes, it mentions it converting from a B to a C. I thought that was interesting. B4, look at 42 to a change to a C70 down at the bottom. Keep on going. Next, right there. Yep. Oh, yeah. yeah. So it was ordered. Yeah, it was ordered originally as a uh, 42 tonner and then changed to a 70 ton three truck. So I this is. did that. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So this was the delivery builder's shot right here. Because 701 was the original uh, side number for it that the seams carry had. So it started as one and ended up as another. And then this is uh, 3008, uh, construction number 3008. And it didn't get around as much, but it still uh, lasted for quite a while. I think this one got scrapped in 1940 something down in uh, Oregon. And then 3010 was the other one that was originally out on the coast up here. Um, and that one ended up back in Vancouver and then Aberdeen. And then it ended up on the, out at Raymond, out at uh, by South Bend out there in uh, Willapa Bay. And there's still a big lumbering operation out there at Raymond. And here's a builder shot of the 42 ton shade that was ordered, but it never made it out to the coast. And here's a couple of well after its life 
pictures on the right. And this is a link down here, this uh, geardsteam.com. And I'll post these, I'll post these, uh, all my links and stuff on the grab iron in my, I'll call them show notes. Um, if anybody's interested in any other research on locomotives and stuff. But this is a great website. It's got all kinds of stuff. All right, so one of the practices that they that they used out, the Army used in particular, for the aircraft quality spruce um, that no one else really did was a was um, reducing the size of the logs by this technique called riving. What riving is, and I spelled my spell checkers fixed it to reviving down here. <laughs> riving involves uh, splitting logs cut lengthwise using wedges and jacks out in the woods and then hauling the the lumber out. It's a very wasteful method, um, but you can consider it's considerably faster than hauling and milling full size logs, which were very large and hard to manipulate. Um, on the lines that were constructed. Uh, trucks could also be used to haul the lumber because there's a lot smaller chunks to take out. Um, and the large, the humongous bandsaw mills that were required for cutting the old growth uh, logs, they were not required as much for the ribbed logs because they're much smaller. So you could use smaller mills and uh, move the lumber around a lot faster. So it's a very uh, <clears throat> labor intensive technique. On here on the left, you see some guys standing around a log and they got a bunch of uh, wedges jammed into, into the log. So they just keep jamming those in there until it splits. And then once it splits, they start jamming wedges in the split. And once the split gets wide enough, they jam jacks in there and then they start jacking the log until it snaps. And then you end up with these uh, pieces in the end, which are much smaller than what you started with. But you can imagine how much fun, <laughs> in quotes, how much fun that would be to be involved with the something like that, you know, splitting logs like this out in the woods. But here's an example of a, a nice modeling sample or subject, looks like, of a, a logging truck hauling out a rived uh, log out of the woods on a plank road. And there's lots of these plank roads out there. And then once you got the stuff to the mill, uh, we load these, load the stuff up on uh, cars and haul them to where they need to go. Um, it's just a general examples of guys loading up spruce on different types of cars, use flat cars, gondolas, Sometimes they would use box cars, a little bit more difficult with box cars. But uh, yeah, lots of lumber being moved from Washington and Oregon. All right, so, whoops. So some of the, some of my research, the, the only reason, one of the reasons I found this spruce production um, stuff was when I was researching a prototype to kind of emulate when I was building modules for the ON30 modular group. Um, so what I ended up with is the uh, Bay Lumber Company that's um, on the east side of Willapa Bay. It was uh, like the only narrow gauge line that was out there. It's about two miles long and uh, is very unsuccessful. It didn't last very long. They had one locomotive so I just kind of like use it as a proto fictional something to keep building on um, and kind of theme my, my logging equipment and camps and stuff after the, uh, the Bay Lumber Company. But during that time when I was doing my research, that's when I found the spruce production mentioned on some of the old maps. I'm like, oh, what's that all about? And then kept digging further and digging further and ended up like in a quagmire of historical information. Um, so there's a lot of info on the spruce production uh, railroads out there if you're truly interested in it, because there was a lot of operations all up and down the West Coast uh, through Washington and Oregon. And it's, it's very interesting what they did. 
There's also, there was also a book published. It's called um, Soldiers in the Woods by Rod Crosley, which is a complete, it's got everything. It talks about all the divisions, all the, all the equipment, locomotives, everything they use, you know, how much money they spent, everything. Anything, anything and everything you want to know is in that book. But anyway, this is, you know, the end result of my efforts building stuff, not necessarily Spruce Production Division, but kind of influenced by it. My, my fictional story about the Bay Lumber Company is that they continued on after World War II and uh, were contracted to haul the existing logs that were left out in the area. So they, they kept them going for, for quite a while. And that's how they continued existing beyond what they originally did, which was only for a couple of years. And just some general photos. The sign on my little structure says 1919 Bay Logging Company, Nemo, Washington. All right, so today, what can you see out there? Well, today there's the Olympic Discovery Trail, which is a trail that basically starts in Port Townsend and more or less follows the Milwaukee Road all the way out to Joyce, like it originally did. And then there's a section you go across to Piedmont on the uh, north side of Lake Crescent. And then there's the Spruce Railroad Grade Trail along the north side of Lake Crescent, which follows the old railroad grade. Then you end up back near 101. You cross the highway at 101, and you get on the original railroad grade uh, just south of 101 and all the way down to Lake Pleasant, where the Essenes Carry mill operation was at, which is now the town of Beaver, and all the way down to Forks, and then all the way out to La Push. So you can ride your bicycle all the way, it's like a, over 100 miles, something like that. <clears throat> but there's all kinds of different points that you can come in and out at. Like one of the, a good point to, uh, to jump in on it is uh, at Blind, where the casino's at, they have a big parking area there. And then there's basically a paved trail. It, you're not following the highway. It's a paved bicycle trail that goes all the way from Blind uh, to Squim. You ride through Squim, and you can ride all the way to Port Angeles if you want to on, uh, on paved, sometimes gravel. It's a hard packed gravel uh, bicycle trail. It's, very, it's really nice. Um, you can hike it or walk it. I mean, people walk their dogs and stuff out there. But it's a, it's a great area to explore. There's, there's some old trestles still out there from the Milwaukee Road that are preserved. And now you can, you can hike or ride across them. I think I got a couple of pictures. Yeah, so here's my uh, logging research vehicle in action. This is the Joyce Station here, the Joyce, old Joyce Depot. There's a museum in there when it's open. It has a uh, logging artifacts and some information about the spruce division in there. And then uh, this is a view of uh, Lake Crescent from the Spruce Railroad Trail. The Spruce Railroad Trail right now is getting rebuilt. Um, it's actually closed right now. It's supposed to be open here pretty soon. And they're rebuilding the whole thing as part of the National Park, Olympic National Park. You can still ride your bicycle out there, just you can't right now because it's being rebuilt. And here's one of the trestles that's out on the, uh, somewhere between Squim and Port Angeles, I think. Johnson Creek trestle. So that was uh, one of the Milwaukee Road trestles. It's still out there. Here's another railroad trestle. And then this is a secret trestle I found out in the woods um, that's still there. It's not part of the trail. It's kind of next to it, but it's deep in the woods, but it, it's still there, still standing. Kind of cool to see that kind of stuff. So if you need to do some nut bolt trestle bent study, there's still some old trestles out there. And this is a close up view of the, uh, the Spruce Railroad Trail rebuild area. So this is um, the 
trailhead uh, just outside of Piedmont, and then trail follows the follows the railroad line. There's the two tunnels, McPhee Tunnel, and then the Daily Rankin Tunnel. The two tunnels that were used originally, and then here's the existing um, rail to road section right here going to the uh, west side of the Lake Crescent. So once this is done, you'll be able to ride all the way from Port Angeles or hike, whatever you want to do, all the way from Port Angeles, all the way out to Forks without having to uh, transit on Highway 101 at all, which would be kind of cool. And then these are some these are some views I just recently got from the uh, um, Park Service website on some of the construction efforts that are going on right now. Uh, so it's going to be a nice trail. You can see some. There's a this picture on the lower right hand side. They're still grading it, but it's going to be a nice paved paved pathway that goes along the north side of the lake, and it's close to all motorized traffic. So it'll be pretty cool. There's a view on the left there of one of the tunnels, a little bridge leading to it. So I'm kind of excited to see that open up. It'd be kind of cool. And then that's what I have for the Spruce Production Division on the north coast of the Olympic Peninsula. Questions? Very nice job, Rich. Thank you. Yeah, that's a lot of research. Uh, when they reopened that trail, uh, I did it many years ago, but that uh, trail along the north side of the lake is really worth it. And uh, you can walk for miles. Uh, I walked it. I didn't bike it. And since it's mostly flat, you can go for miles and miles. So it's well worth the effort to get out there. Yeah. And the, most of that Olympic Discovery Trail is pretty much flat. So, you know, if you, if you jump in at Blind, where the casino's at, it's almost a flat route all the way to Port Angeles. Um, so if you do have a bicycle, it's a, it's a great place to go. You know, if you don't, if you want to see some scenery, view some history, cross a couple trussels and things like that. And then, yeah, going all the way out there to Lake Pleasant is definitely worth the effort. At the Pacific Modelers Congress, Loggers Congress, uh, several years ago, there was a presentation about building that model of the mill that's in the museum down there. Mm. And the individual who built that um, had some very creative ways of um, deciding how he was going to build it and what the parts were and everything. It was, it was amazing that he came up with uh, <clears throat> the, the, the final product the way he did. They were essentially built in four by eight sheet modules and then each one had to be hauled down and put in the, in the museum. Um, my other comment has to do with Port Townsend Southern was supposed to attach to the other end of the Port Townsend Southern, which had purchased the what was left of the Olympia Tonino Railroad. And they were going to connect together after going uh, up past the golf course in Olympia and over to Shelton. And it, it it got stuck going in both directions, as you indicated. Um, I worked on a plat that was in uh, Port Sounds and area, and the back property had a big cut through it where the old railroad grade had been. It was kind of interesting to see that. Yeah, there's a lot of cool history out there. Let me see if I can do this. Here's that. Here's a full size picture. That's the only one I have of that. Um, module of the sawmill in Vancouver. It looks like, yeah, you know, it looks like they might, looks like it's operational, maybe, also. It's because they use regular turnouts and stuff like that on it. It appears like, anyway. So 
So yeah, it'll be something to go visit once uh, we can go visit stuff again. <laughs> yeah, the the presentation that he gave only dealt with the portion of the um, the mill right here on the left end of it. He didn't even get into some of this other stuff. And of course, it, they barely got it running and the war was over. Yeah, so that's what, you know, that's what happened on the North Coast of the Olympics is, like I said, they didn't even finish that line before the war was over. And then the Army's like, well, we're going to get rid of all this stuff. So a lot of stuff went back to Vancouver and then got liquidated there. And a lot of stuff got sold off on site. Um, and, but, you know, lumbering continued on the North coast, we know with Rainier got going out there, um, and some of those other smaller lumbering outfits, um, kept going. But Rainier was the biggest one. Um, they, you know, they were very successful and, uh, they were, they were running steam locomotives out there, um, going out to Siku until the 1960s you know, the big malaise that they had and humongous shays. Yeah, they were, they ran until the mid sixties, I think. Wright brothers first flight was 1903. So somebody corrected me on that. Thank you. That was Sid. Museum of flight at Boeing field has a section of world war one airplanes. I haven't been to, I haven't been to museum in flight for shoot over 20 years, I think. I need to go back down there sometime. The, I do, I have been to the Aerospace Museum in uh, San Diego. And the one in San Diego has a nice uh, collection of World War I stuff as well. So if you ever get down there, maybe visiting the, um, um, the Tehachapi Loop layout at Balboa Park, definitely worth seeing. And then going down to the Aerospace Museum. All right. So, like I said, if you're if you're if you are interested, I will post uh, links and stuff on the uh, grab iron on the same announcement for this clinic. I'll just add to it, and uh, then you can click away from there. Thanks everyone for showing up, and see you guys at the next clinic.